Hello and welcome. I'm Rochelle. I head up the Alumni and Development Office at Trinity Hall and I'm pleased to welcome you to our uh, latest in our Alumni and Academia webinars. Uh, we're joined today by alumnus Professor Chris Carr who was uh, with us in college in 1970 and is now at the University of Edinburgh Business School and also Trinity Hall Fellow uh, Professor Jennifer Howard Grenville. So we've got about 60 people registered for today, um, parents, friends, alumni from seven decades through from 1953 all the way through to current students. And we have people registered in 11 different countries. I'll do a quick shout out. So Belgium, Canada, Denmark, France, Germany, Hungary, Ireland, Switzerland, Netherlands, the US and the UK. So welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank all of you uh, that have made a donation alongside um, our online events throughout this year to help support students during the pandemic. It's hugely appreciated and we're very grateful for your support. So thank you so much. <laughs> Now, I'm going to be handing over to Jennifer. So Professor Jennifer Howard Grenville is the Diageo Professor of Organization Studies at the Cambridge Judge Business School. She's an expert in qualitative research and organizational change and explores how people and organizations generate and navigate change related to sustainability. So I'll hand over to you, Jen. Thank you so much, Shell, and welcome everyone. It's delightful to be here with you. Um, those of you who are joining from all of those different countries will see me squinting into the late afternoon, early evening Cambridge sun. Um, we're celebrating that after a few days of really strange May weather. So um, I apologize in advance if my uh, if, if I look a little funny, but um, we're dealing with weather. Um, I'm delighted to um, join you all this evening and to welcome our guest. Um, as you know, it's Professor Chris Carr, and most importantly, he is a Trinity Hall alum. He studied engineering and economics at Trinity Hall in 1970, and is currently a professor um, of corporate strategy at the University of Edinburgh Business School. Um, he's had a long and fascinating career, including over 10 years with British Aerospace and GKN, um, with experience both from the engineering and the economics and the accounting side um, in understanding those companies, their supply chains and their global strategies. Um, most recently, he's published the book um, that we'll talk about this evening, Glo Global Oligopolies. Um, it's published in 2020 by Rutledge, and it is an amazing piece of work because it covers not only the industries that we might suspect would have oligopolies within them, but he covers every sector and he tells us that oligopolies are far more common than we might expect. Um, why should we care about oligopolies? Is it just the dominance of Amazon or Facebook that we should think about um, as, as people concerned with business, economics, public policy, and as average citizens in the coming decades? Well, the answer is no. I think we have a very exciting hour ahead um, to explore these questions of just how ubiquitous are global oligopolies? Um, what are they? Why do they matter? And why do they reshape how we think about both business strategy and economic policy. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Chris, and start with this first question is, um, what are global oligopolies and why do they matter? Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, I think the first point is that it's a word that no one likes pronouncing. I mean, oligos is the Greek word, simply meaning few. Most of us know exactly what we mean by monopoly because we've all played it. Mono, of course, is one and oligos is a few, typically four. And uh, what has happened is that we've gone from very fragmented competition in the world where you had thousands of players to highly concentrated industries. So even Adam Smith, and I come from Edinburgh, the, the land of Adam Smith, Adam Smith's famous pin industry uh, is actually, by 1980, my economics tutor, Cliff Braddon at Trinity Hall, had written an article to say, well, actually, they're down to four major players, a couple in Europe and a couple in North America, and that's really controlling the whole industry. So that's a huge change, and it's an ugly word, but typically four major players, sometimes 10, but it's a small number, dominate really the main wealth creation sectors in the world today. And that changes the rules of the game. 
both if you're a company and if you are a country hoping to actually gain national wealth, uh, as Adam Smith's original question. So that's fascinating because, of course, mm -hmm. pin manufacturing was the the sort of initial argument um, and, you know, the observation and Adam Smith's um, the you know, sort of assumption that the market will sort everything out. But um, but surprisingly, actually, the market has become much more consolidated in many of these sectors, um, as, as your book points out. So one of the things I did want to make sure the audience knows is we would love to take questions throughout the conversation. We have a Q&A um, section. So please pose your questions at any time because I'll be monitoring those and uh, we may not get to every question, but we'll try to as we go. Um, and we have uh, several opportunities throughout the conversation, not just at the end where I'll turn to your question. So please start in with them. And um, Chris, maybe you could say a little bit more about, um, about oligopolies. I mean, I guess we, we've sort of seen the other extremes, which are um, you know, free markets where supposedly there is an abundance of competition and many, many, many businesses can um, start up and, and thrive and die and you know, move through. Um, we've got at the other extreme monopolies, but what is the evidence on, um, on, on global oligopolies and, and where are they concentrated? Where do we find them? Um, and well, what does that do to the rules of the game? Yeah, absolutely right, Jennifer. So uh, it's the ubiquity of these oligopolies that's so important, even in niche positions, even vertically integrated through the chain. So let me, let me try and uh, introduce that map. And it's by having a map that we are very powerful in a way that Adam Smith could never do in terms of really mapping new wealth creation. So I'll try and give some slides on that if we can bear with me uh, with a few uh, technical slides at this moment. So I'll uh, try and share that. And um, let's just make sure you haven't got any controls showing. Uh, so I need in control. So, um, hopefully, can I just check that you you can see those slides okay? And, um, and yeah, so I'll just say yeah, that. Okay. Small, well, first, one so first small of all, box at the center, if you at the center top, if you if there's something little that you can move, but otherwise, I think yeah, that's it. One tiny little blip. I can't cut that down shorter. I'm afraid. So okay, we'll live with uh, that. So uh, firstly, I've, I've included an email in case anyone wants to follow up. It's just chris.carr at ed is Edinburgh and dot ac for academic dot UK. So let me, uh, my background, by the way, was as, as Angela's pointed out, 10 years in industry, a chartered engineer, chartered accountant and international project management experience. But I then came back to do my PhD, looking at global competition, mainly in automotive to begin with, and then taking that around through over 40 years through about 380 companies, uh, looking at how they handle global strategy uh, in about 21 countries in the world. And that has led to this book, Global Oligopoly, a key idea for business and society. Now the key difference in the world is, is really Adam Smith, whose idea of the mark, open market capitalism absolutely fueled Britain and America, the most successful forms of wealth creation perhaps the world has ever seen. Britain in the 18th century, then America in the 19th century. And first of all, we have to respect how powerful that framework is. And it's set against the whole history of feudalism where we had frankly all wealth was appropriated by kings, by some extent uh, church and to some extent, the other element were really uh, monopolies. They were granted monopolies often by the king and that controlled all wealth. And the difficulty for the world was that until that changed, we were in a Malthusian trap where every time wealth began to increase potentially, population would increase. And in fact, there was virtually no economic progress century after century. And it was that that Adam Smith was up against. Then came huge changes 
legal institutions, limited liability companies, international capital markets. And then came companies like GKN, where I worked, we were the pioneers in 1776 of iron and coal. And that created an industrial revolution on which America then took on. And amazingly, how positive it was for growth. As Adam Smith pointed out, all economists are all Jeremiah's. Don't believe them. Actually, you do the right basic things and it's amazing how successful you can be in terms of wealth creation. And indeed, Britain went from the number two in terms of GDP per capita uh, to Holland, incidentally, um, at that time. And by the Battle of Waterloo, we were actually number one in terms of GDP per capita. So he was right. I mean, that approach to wealth creation was highly successful. The notion was scale economies through division of labor. He pointed out in the pin industry, you had 400 fold increase in productivity if you could use modern factories, if you could use those markets. But the hypothesis is that markets are so fragmented, there are thousands and thousands of players. And that means there would be no monopoly, there would be no oligopoly. And the lacunae in his model is that, well, if that was true, you wouldn't even need to know about geographies. If there were really so many companies competing, it would be a commodity market. Actually, even technology would be perceived as exogenous. You would not have to open the box on corporate strategy at all, because the assumption is there are so many tiny little companies that assumption has now proved to be out of date. So we look at historically that most sectors like pins were indeed perhaps fragmented. You had lots of rivals. And even in one country like Britain at that time, there would have been lots and lots of competitors. But it was polarized in Smith's day. He was aware that there would be just a tiny number of quite powerful national monopolies. So he's aware that you might have that extreme. And in fact, there was one global monopolist, the Dutch East India Company. If you correct to modern day prices, its market cap is equivalent to 7.9 trillion on par with any of the top internet companies today. They control all India all trade, but that was very rare and that was a global monopolist. What has changed is that today we have a few near global monopolists like Google, but actually the vast majority of sectors are now global oligopolies. And that means a few like typically four will dominate all profits and wealth creation. Maybe a few more, it may go up to 10, but that is the typical situation today, unlike uh, anticipated by Adam Smith. Also, you will have some sectors, a few, not particularly high on power, but you have public sectors, you have services like hairdressers and people like that they will be highly fragmented. And, uh, but what is normally gonna happen is you get global oligopolies and instead of equilibrium as in modern equilibrium economics, actually the position is highly dynamic. It's extremely difficult to ride the wave of concentration patterns that are Schumpeterian in nature really difficult to ride the musical chairs of modern competition. And in that situation, there are new rules for wealth creation, whether you are a company or whether you are a nation, because we control most wealth, even of most nations as global oligopolists. So, so can I jump in here, Chris? Yeah. So what yeah. you're telling us is uh, we shouldn't think of these sort of four key players who obviously don't control the entire um, sector, but who can who dominate it. 
we shouldn't think of them as, as static. We shouldn't think of those as fixed positions. Um, it's not, you know, it, it's not like the East India Company. It, it's, um, it's something that is continuing to challenge them, even yeah. though there's this sort of, uh, you know, it doesn't matter which sector, maybe it doesn't even matter what technology basis it is. Um, so, so that's fascinating. And I can see we're on the next slide where you're going to break down how it does change by sector. And, and yeah. maybe you can tell us more about, you know, what are the underlying reasons why sectors find different um, places on this map? And also, um, how dynamic is it to compete within those sectors? Yeah, that's a very important point, Jennifer, um, because there are situations where it's relatively stable. Um, in aerospace, you know, uh, at British Aerospace, you know, Boeing, British Aerospace, Airbus, that's a very stable oligopoly. In audit, audits are very stable oligopolies relatively. So there are some where it's relatively static, but mostly it's a much more dynamic process. If it was stable, we get much more worried about public policy because these guys can appropriate profits for years. If it's dynamic, so long as the internet companies are getting challenged, it's less serious. So Zoom has only just arrived and if it meets its new competition, that's dynamic and we would be less worried about that. So here on the map, what we do is to get that dynamism. We first, David Collis and myself working at Harvard back in 2006, began by mapping sectors and what we do here is we just began we could only show 50 on this article um, but we show the earlier concentration nine years earlier and then the most recent at that time and then by if you're above the 45 degree line you're increasing if you're below the the line you're decreasing and you can see that there are a few sectors that uh, like wine where it is relatively fragmented, even globally, but I have to say even there, you'll see quite big moves. If we look at steel pharmaceuticals, there are some very big global M&As, mergers and acquisitions, very big moves going on even at that level. But we can express where we are on the map and to some extent we can show the dynamism here. And that's really important. If we are above this line and up at the top, we tend to be in a more powerful position to appropriate wealth easily. That's the global oligopolist having fun. What more typically happens is we drop possibly below the line and we start oscillating because we hit massive competition. Cars is an example. GM went bankrupt. It's the world number one because it's experiencing intense competition from Toyota and the Germans and then will come other new players and Tesla's now coming along. So that dynamism is important. And I'll just capture that for you in a moment. But let me just show you the pattern uh, before I show you the dynamism. After that, that was 2006, we then extended to a couple of hundred industries. So we've got a very good map of the world economy here, showing you exactly the concentration metrics. And you can see there are very few sectors where it's very fragmented indeed. And I have created a new kind of global force, which is rather like the uh, wind force scale for sailors, you know, being a yachtsman myself, um, we, we, we like to use wind forces um, to show the level and intensity of concentration. So if we're down here at a force two, that's very low indeed. Um, and then more concentrated oligopolistic industries like the internets are up the top. But you can see the change between 1994, 2009, there's been a big shift towards greater global concentration, which is strategically very important for companies and nations. The dynamism that you mentioned, Jennifer, is one way of picking that out is to show you the wave over time. Now, here's 15 sectors. Um, and we show the global concentration metric. That's just the share of the top four players in the world. So you can see sometimes the share goes right up to 80% in, in 
that industry, aero engines, uh, sometimes it's a bit lower. But you can see that it's fortunately not just stable, it's, it's cycling in a manner that would be predicted by Professor Schumpeter and a, a very dynamic process, a very tough process to compete against. So broadly, can what has happened? Um, yeah. Can, can I that. jump in? Because we've got a question in the chat and it's interesting too, because basically what you're breaking down for us is, is all sectors have oligopolies essentially, but not all oligopolies are equal. So there are some sectors in which there's a much higher level of concentration, which of course Absolutely. means um, more dominance by fewer players and less sort of free competition as it were. And it's interesting that you show the sort of waves of you know what we might have as sort of disruption um you know unseating of incumbents and i think we could all point to tesla and and um, what's happening in the car industry is some of that but curiously you've also shown in this you know some of these lines d f etc b sharply rising in the sense that they're becoming dominated by fewer players in my head naturally i think about some of the big internet sort of technology giants um and we've got a question in the chat from peter so, you know, some of these we sort of think anecdotally might be becoming more oligopolistic, having less competition because they're dominated by a handful of huge firms. Peter points out that actually, by contrast, potentially the technology world might not be as global as we think. He says China, Russia, and even India and Brazil are now long, no longer accessible for Google, Uber, Facebook, and others. So he's questioning, are we talking about oligopoly in the Western world only? And I'm noticing you've gathered these data over so many years, but is there something happening that now in 2021, we might see reversal of trends, especially in some of these technology centered in industries where actually, you know, ubiquitous market access can no longer be assumed? Um, well, actually, the, one of the reasons that this data is so difficult to get is because you do need global data and that will typically include China, etc. But actually the typical pattern is that very often the concentration metric will fall, the share of the top four player. And one of the reasons, one of the major reasons is the emergence of emerging market champions from India and China. Of course, as the world becomes more global, those markets become bigger and that itself reduces the level of concentration and that actually reduces the level of concentration even of google because it does not have full access to china and it's got real rivals in china so we need to include the chinese data and the indian data and the russian data wherever possible in the global data so the normal pattern, there are three chapters on the book dealing with emerging market champions from China, from Russia, from India and Brazil, for example. It's very important to realize that there are two dynamics leading to this Schumpeterian effect. One is when you get another fantastic entrepreneur like Tesla, a disruptor, and we see a lot of that right now, Zoom itself. But the other major element that disrupts the industry even more are the emerging market champions coming from India and China. So in cars, you know, the Chinese are producing 24 million cars uh, compared with under, under, you know, five or so million now in America. Now, a lot of the Chinese production is from GM and VW. So our joint ventures are in there but they are huge and absolutely right. We have to consider them. And it's two elements that are driving the disruption. It's one is the entrepreneurs, the disruptors, and the other element is that we are not used to sometimes seeing the power of those competitors from emerging markets. And even the fact that their markets are so large, will other things being equal reduce the power and, con and power of the incumbent in an advanced country. So GM was losing share because of that and, and hitting the double whammy of both Tesla type disruption, 
the Japanese and the German disruption, but also hitting competition coming in increasingly from emerging markets. Yeah, I think um, that, that's fantastic. And it's interesting to think about that, both the emerging market sort of contribution, but I think it's on the one hand, we can have sort of battles over the pie from emerging uh, players who might be located in emerging markets or not in emerging markets. Uh, yep. But at the same time, I think your comments and Peter's point out that the, the size of the pie itself is growing, right? Because as yep. we see new markets becoming um, players on the, on the global scale and new patterns of consumption, that actually we're dealing with a different pie. And in some ways we might not be dealing with a pie that's equally accessible to all. Um, we're gonna get onto your next slide and next points. Um, I will encourage um, more questions in the chat because we're gonna keep going and, um, and, uh, and move towards a sense of sort of what, what does this all mean for a strategy? Because um, I think we are giving a sense that it, it is really complex. Um, there are patterns that we see across industry sectors, but a lot of details within the dynamics of a given industry sector that are important for business people to pay attention to. So thank you, Chris, and keep, keep coming with your questions. So what I will do then is just quickly show how this changes Adam Smith and how I, we have a universal perspective that I've now developed um, and conceptually, and then I'll quickly uh, if I can just go on to how do we become a top global player in the world um, and try and give you a sense of the strategic implication there. But just conceptually, what's important to imagine are two kind of axes. If you know the level of concentration, it fundamentally alters your perception of everything. And I'm here in this diagram going to show you, we can take two axes, take the Y axis as just the global locus of rivalry. Some industries are obviously global. Some are obviously local like hairdressing. So and some, one or two are regional, say all Europe, for example. So if you imagine, first of all, positioning a sector on that axis, then position on the X axis, where the x-axis is defined by the actual concentration metric that is appropriate to that level. So if we were in a national market, I would just take the share of the top four players nationally. If I'm in the regional market, I would do that across, say, Europe. But mostly in most sectors, I must do that globally with genuine global data. So my x-axis simply shows the position of the global concentration metric CR4 moving to the right. Now, when you do that, you can position sectors and show how they are moving. So Adam Smith's pin industry started pretty national, relatively uh, fragmented, but has moved up to global and was moved up to very co high concentration by 1980. And we'll see sector after sector like beer or appliances, where in the last few years, we've seen massive M&As taking place globally as the battles globally have hotted up. And that changes our perception on the world. If the world was predominated still by Adam Smith neoclassical economics, then we would get more global, but Adam Smith's axis, would we would go straight up the y-axis, straight up the left-hand side, because every time concentration increased, new entrants would keep us close to that axis and we would end up at the top. That is a, a market-based economy, economic approach to the economy. The opposite extreme is Marxist. The opposite extreme says, well, wait a minute. If your concentration is so high, if the scale economies are so high, you'll end up with global monopolists. That would be the top right. So under a Marxist perspective, capitalism is so exploitational, we should have revolutions. We had two parts of the world ready to blow each other to smithereens with nuclear weapons. They felt so differently. Um, but if the whole world was predominated by those sectors, they would have a certain economic justification. 
unfortunately, neither side is right. We typically, predominance of sectors is here much more in the middle. Unfortunately, it's not static, it's dynamic, it's cycling, and my goodness, they compete. So, but we can nevertheless map the world. Okay, but as a company, what are we going to do strategically? Well, there's a lot of evidence, mainly from America, because the economists tended to use just US data, unfortunately. But even Jack Welsh at General Electric's rule of thumb, which we would tend to share, is you do want to be a top three or four global player. And the logic is that we've got massive scale economies. So typically we can make and appropriate most of the profits if we can make it to those top few players. If you come down to even number seven, you're getting down towards a bit of a ditch where your performance is quite difficult to keep up with the big guys. What then happens is that there are lots and lots of tiny niche players. Now that can be profitable, but it can also be very unprofitable and it's very often very small. And I have a chapter in my book of how to play the niche name. It can be very profitable, but it's not that easy. They are global monopolies too. So how do you get to be say a, a dominant player globally? Well, at GKN, they were the Iron Masters, and they did have to start from scratch as entrepreneurs in 1759, uh, David Guest uh, at GKM, and um, whole history, Lady Charlotte Guest, who was the chief executive, um, you know, was already right across the world in Russia, we were selling them uh, uh, their rail lines, working with Brunel, and in fact, we have a lot of experience, that company of going global. And uh, today it's uh, aerospace parts and automotive. So I was very lucky to join a four man team at GKM back in 79, 80. And we had positions across Europe in France, Italy, Germany, and we had uh, Hardy Spicer in Birmingham, which unfortunately has just closed down uh, a month ago. Uh, but the guys, in Germany and Unic Harden were brilliant, particularly Unic Harden. And we then found an opportunity that the world car industry, America could see they had to have small cars. They had to have more fuel efficient cars to take on Japan. So Ford actually played our entire investment costs of our little four man team building two huge factories in uh, Carolina, Sanford and Raleigh. So we had site teams out there building the factories, greenfield sites. And we could take every single element of best practice from Unicarden in Germany, uh, or, and we had IPR, we had the best patents in the world, and we could duplicate top technology in America that we had available in Europe. As I did that, teams then went in to, with joint venture through 30 countries around the world. So uh, Japan, we had to sort out with effectively a license deal with NTN. Um, that's a weaker strategy. But in India and in China, we could put in joint ventures, which were based pretty well on the same factories so we can benchmark globally. And that was very successful when global worldwide, we took about 40% of the entire global market. And so if we take more recently Russia, um, I was lecturing, I lectured at Moscow State University. And I remember saying to them, well, okay, 2013 Ford are going into St. Petersburg. We had to help Ford in America. What do you guys think? Is going to happen in Russia now. And one of my students said, well, actually, I'm negotiating from the Russian government. I know full well what you're doing. You are going in with Greenfield site. You'll build a site from scratch. And it's amazing that that was exactly how we started the operation in the USA with our team doing exactly that. That's Greenfield site. But to go global, uh, yeah. just finish. Just to go well, you need to be pretty good on three major 
weapons. Greenfield science, which is pretty much engineering project management, but you need to handle the big mergers and acquisitions where necessary and you need to handle joint ventures. So every one of our joint ventures 30 years later has now moved to full M&A. We've taken over the final uh, control of those companies. Yeah. That's just so, an example. No, this is fascinating because I think many of us, or at least I sometimes think that, um, you know, when, especially when we're talking about global oligopolies, we think of sort of the, we think of the brand, right? We think of the buyer um, in a supply chain. And what yeah. you've told us is actually GKN, it, it's not Ford, uh, um, it's not Toyota, but it managed to maneuver itself into a position where it was a major player um, with all of these brands. And so, you know, it almost feels like the tail wagging the dog um, in terms of maneuvering into strong positions. We might, we might conclude and, and other economists might, might argue that the Japanese um, brands would be creating their own domestic supply chain. Um, the US brands would be building domestic supply there. Obviously there's reasons not to and technology and, and capabilities has a lot of a lot behind that. But maybe you can unpack that for us a little bit. Um, you know, because this is this is not Facebook, this is not Amazon, this is not the brand yeah. that's leading, that's seeking market dominance. This is actually very much a tier one supplier. Um, and and yeah. what what's the thinking behind that? How does one actually create this dominance? I think I think it's very important to distinguish different industries. You know, we have some sectors like ours that were very industrial, but I think we need to contrast different situations. A lot of sectors are in the consumer sectors. The brand is going to be far more important. So thank you for raising that. So when Diageo goes global, for example, where we have a chapter in the book on, on that, um, their major scale economies are less, a little bit less on the on the operation side, and much more on the money. The investment is going into marketing the brand, and secondly, it goes into distribution for Diageo. So those are the key scale economies for them. If you are in a consumer market, the key scale economies will be slightly different in terms of the value chain, you're going to be putting much more emphasis onto marketing and branding when you go global. And that's, and in that case, Diageo used uh, merger, the Diageo itself is a, is a major merger of two international British players using brands, uh, you know, typically the spirits industry brands and also even our great beer brands and so on. So it is important to understand the sector you're working in to see where the key scale economies are going to come. Um, I think, and and please put some questions in the in the Q and A if you want to um, share a question or share your experience, um, because I think the, the main message that that um, all sectors seem to be um, very either dominated by or their their competition is governed by um, global oligopolies is a powerful message, but the way in which that actually unfolds sort of depends. It depends on a lot of things. If you, as, as you've said, is it the brand? Is it the, you know, what aspect of it is it? Um, what are things that might have changed over the years in terms of these dynamics? Because I'm thinking again, when we think of some of, you know, think about Zoom, it has no greenfield sites. In fact, I don't even know how many employees Zoom has. Um, it must have very few really. And so yeah. a lot of these, you know, Uber, a lot of these huge companies that we're hearing about um, having, you know, moving very, very swiftly to incredibly powerful positions. Um, Yes, they probably do joint ventures. Yes, there's probably some M and A, but there's no such thing as manufacturing for many of them. So, no. are we are we needing to think differently these days, or is it the same kinds of rules of the game? Um, well, I, would, I would argue that actually, in some ways, it's making global strategy much more easy. But it's important to realize that that what is happening there is that when you when you've got a really great business model, and particularly the internet models. Very often there is what we call an externality. The, the cost, the marginal cost of getting that Zoom service to 
extra people around the world is actually relatively low if there's externalities. When you have network effects like that, it's possible to be almost born global. Those guys are able to take those business models that are incredibly competitive. They can take them global much more easily than we have. In both cases, we are putting assets on the ground, but they may not need as many assets to cover the whole global market. That gives them even more powerful scale economies. So actually, although some of the biggest barriers are, as, as we've encountered in the past, political, you know, whether the Chinese will let you in or not, um, you know, that, you can, that can be quite hard. You know, we have to put assets into China to, to get in. I think we should distinguish different situations. I mean, typically in aerospace, where I was at British Aerospace, what's happening there is that, you know, you've, your big scale economies come in, frankly, R&D, the cost of developing a new aircraft is so high. Then we've got pretty big scale economies in manufacturing, but an awful lot of technology up front. So in that sector, historically, Boeing uh, with the jumbo jet, would rely very heavily on trade and probably wouldn't need to put assets in in terms of foreign direct investment. Zoom doesn't need quite so much foreign direct investment, but in most sectors, most of us, as we have this example of GKN, most of us have to put in a lot of foreign direct investment around the world. That's where the, the investment is commitment. It's money going in. And so that's usually a very uh, expensive process. And that is why global, going global is very hard to do and why it's so committing in terms of resources. But once we get those market positions, we have huge scale economies. So it's quite difficult to come at us in terms of competing against us yeah so so that's fascinating i mean it and it's true that the um you know the the level of commitment the level of investment the level of of you know whether it's a plant in the ground or capabilities developed or uh, or a brand um name that means something um in a given country that is actually quite hard to reverse especially we need to remind ourselves even in a digital economy um you know, there, there's a lot of hardware, there's a lot of stuff that still um, that still uh, is, is produced to support that. Um, we've got a couple of questions. Um, Carl says, is oligarch a pejorative term and should it be? Um, I don't know what you make of that, but I think that's quite yeah, a... Just clarify good. that because uh, the publishers very nearly tried to put the word oligarch in the book and I had to point out it's a completely different concept, really. I mean, we have a lot of oligarchs in Russia, and an oligarch refers typically to a person or an operator. It's typically a person who has a great deal of power uh, because he controls a lot of money. And an oligarch, you know, is typically, you know, we think of these kind of uh, Russian entrepreneurs at the time of all the chaos in Russia, uh, where they appropriated huge amounts of money, massive amounts of money, and then they had great power. So it could even get connected with the mafia. And uh, that is pejorative and understandably so. You could argue that, uh, that oligopolies create um, uh, extremely wealthy people. Bill Gates, for example, you, you could call him an oligarch in the sense that Microsoft was an oligopoly and uh, part of an oligopoly, but the oligopoly refers to the whole sector. And a single oligopolist is typically then a company. But Bill Gates's company would have been an oligopolist and it would have made him one of the most wealthy men in the world. Is that term pejorative? I would argue no, not if it is not if, if that wealth has been acquired legitimately. And in the case of Bill Gates, the amount of money that he has channeled in to uh, helping the world uh, right now is amazing. And that to me, you know, he deserves a knighthood. I mean, Buffett and, and, and 
gates working together could both be called oligarchs in a sense because they both have come from companies that have oligopolies. But Africa has had more lives saved through one project wiping out malaria from their combined uh, philanthropy operation than in the whole history of, of Africa. So it depends what the wealthy people do with that money. Um, it is true that they could be acquiring very, very large amounts of money individually yeah. as a result yeah, of well, these very successful so steps. good monopolists, as you point out. So, so thank you, Carl, for that question. And actually, I think that's really important to, to clarify, you know, and in terms of what um, Chris Carr has talked about in his book, it, you know, it's an empirical question, right? So a global, global oligopolies are the level of concentration in the market, um, and then how the the spoils essentially are used from that um, is important. Henrik actually also points out, perhaps in in sort of it, it's a question, but it, it seems to relate. Um, if technology companies are taking advantage of global network effects to create economies of scale, which I think we would observe that this is this is occurring in many places, um, and even if they're close to monopolies. Shouldn't we, um, shouldn't we welcome them as customers? Um, and I think this speaks actually very much to some of the, the concerns that are very live right now. Um, there are many things that I think Facebook would argue it is doing that connect people, that enable things. Um, but there are many, many people who are very um, concerned about what, you know, sort of the, the flip side of these very effects. Um, so what is your sense about- Understandably concerned. Jennifer, because mm. at that level of concentrations, I, uh, I think we have to face reality. You know, the network effects create massive scale economies. And, you know, you can put your head in the sand, but it's there. And but there does come a point where Adam Smith would quite rightly say that at some point you may have to set, step in with antitrust when you are to the extreme right of that chart top right hand corner. That is the Marxist criticism that you can become so appropriating, you need to step in, as we did in the case of the oil industry in America or the railroads industry. We are at that point potentially. However, remember that now the problem is global. If America tries to work, take unilateral action, the big problem is this antitrust committees can only work on one continent. The European antitrust committees can only work on one continent. So what is really welcome now is that we now have an America prepared to talk globally with other major nations. We need a measure of cooperation, even with the Chinese and with Europe. And what is very positive right now is that even Biden is, is saying, yeah, perhaps we should have a minimum corporation tax. That is really positive because Europe might well come on board that. Britain might come on board that. But we even want China to come on board in the emerging markets, the TPP. If they come on board, then that antitrust action can then be done with some degree of global cooperation. If not, you can make a big noise about it in Britain, but your amount of power is very small indeed. Yeah. Let me just kind of move on to the appropriation argument here because it affects policy concerns that matter to all of us. Mm -hmm. My next slide, I'm just showing you the extreme effects of global oligopoly. Um, take just the recent figures for Apple, for example. Their market cap, which is not totally comparable with GDP because we have to convert it to value added measures. But the market cap is the stock market's value of all future profits, which is just part of wealth creation, but it's a very big part. Um, Apple would be two trillion in market cap. It had, uh, that compares with the whole British FTSE at that point of 2.9 trillion. Britain's GDP, 2.8 trillion, US GDP, 21 trillion. Just eight nations had larger DP, GDPs. So if you're interested in the wealth of the nation as an economist, you cannot possibly ignore the impact of even one global oligopoly player, let alone large numbers. 
And even Smith should have been aware that the Dutch East India Company was eight trillion in modern day terms. That was not to be ignored. It controlled all trade, the slave trade indeed, and so on. So today, if we take the top four, then we're up to 6.4 trillion, even just four companies. And they have multiplied by five in the last four or five years. So they are very powerful. Now, let me just show you how we can use big data. We can say, well, okay, you might say, Chris, I'm not really excited by just one sector, but I can now use big data to analyze for you the top 30,000 companies. So imagine I can analyze 30,000 of players like this. This would be the result. So I'm using here Thompson One Banker databases, 30,000 companies. And what I've done is to take every single what we call the GICS, the American General Industrial Classification Code, which is a very broad measure of a sector, rather a broad scope, but to analyze all sectors. To, uh, and what you'll see is if I just take the top four players in each of those 158 sectors, I can add up every single uh, EBITDA, the earnings before tax and interest, I can just add them all up. And here they are for the latest six years, here they are for the latest three years. And notice that the rule of thumb, I can open the box to corporate strategy and still apply it to the whole global economy and analyze it. And the rule of thumb is we take as top four players 45% of everything, all profits, but it's not just that, it's all international sales, it's all R&D, it's all capital expenditure, it's all sales and general administration costs. That's, that's a, the proxy for intangible brand value. And I can show you how many sectors, that's 157. Now notice that if I know your above average concentration from my map, that level of appropriation rises to 60%. And I can analyze the underlying metrics. I know that I need to add on salaries to get the full GDP effect, but I can do that. I can add salary estimates to the profit figures, and I can give you the underlying ratios, return on capital employed, return on sales, sales growth, which are the key metrics for all companies at the strategy level. And I can also analyze that by every country in the world. So I can show you that not only do the top four players appropriate half the wealth, but actually the top four countries in the world control also half the wealth. Um, if you take the top four nations, USA and China particularly, um, they are controlling a very big chunk of wealth. So Chris, I, 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 want, to, I, I want to just notice the time. Um, unfortunately, we're running hard up against our time limit. And um, I think this is a great place to end on the observation that indeed, it's not just the concentration within industry sectors, it's the concentration within countries. And we've yeah. had a very interesting question as our last question from Andrew. Um, he, point, he asks, have you studied how the capacity of oligopolies or monopolies like Facebook, Amazon, et cetera, um, their capacity to pour money into allied sectors. So by this, I presume he means neighboring yeah. sectors, Adjacent acquiring competitors, investing in new technology, and thereby crowding, thereby crowding out smaller players, not just in their own sector, but in yeah. neighboring sectors. So to what degree will we see um, this shaping competition? And as you pointed out, demanding a policy that takes a more global approach if we can to antitrust. So maybe just some closing words on that in our last two minutes. Okay, uh, first of all, that's a very important point. We, we very often use the word adjacencies here and uh, they are very important strategic questions for in any sector because generally speaking, if you loosely diversify into another sector you know nothing about, you tend to have a very poor hit rate in terms of success. What is much more successful in corporate strategy is to move into adjacent sectors where you can leverage the business model advantages you've already got. So indeed, if we were to study a company like Google in detail, we'll see that 
a lot of their corporate strategy is about making adjacency moves exactly as the question is put forward. And that's very powerful indeed. And in fact, that is how the, to some extent, there's a danger of abuse of that global oligopoly position. They are very good at Facebook and uh, Google and so on at potential adjacency moves. And that is the point where we have to check that they are not creating unfair competition. And uh, antitrust would be quite right to be watching that very carefully. And, uh, uh, but it's, it's, it also forces us to look at the definition of the market a little bit more carefully. When we measure the concentration metric, we have to be a bit more careful because they are sometimes moving into what seem to be completely new sectors. But what they are doing is leveraging the competitive advantage from the original global oligopoly position and the massive resources. I mean, just look at Apple's cash flows that it's got on mm. par with nations. We are leveraging that resource to get into an adjacent sector. That point is very important in corporate strategy, very powerful, but also very worrying for antitrust. But again, yeah. I would emphasize you need to cooperate more globally today than would have been the case 50 years ago. We can't just do it in America. We need to extend antitrust uh, to look at that with some degree of global cooperation. Yeah, thank you, Chris. I think um, this has been a fascinating um, look into the enormous wealth of data, evidence and thought behind your ideas. Um, I think it sums it up very compellingly on this slide. Even if you believe in Adam Smith, um, the, the no, world I is- I love it, but- Empirically, well, I was going to say we all do, but um, you know, but empirically, we have arrived in, in a somewhat different place. Um, and even if we're not interested in global wars, um, they are interested in us, and they are very much shaping um, the world in which we consume, in which we do business, and we think about policy and and strategy. And um, it's been fascinating catching up with you. I think everyone on the on this uh, webinar, I, I would invite you to. Check out Chris's book to learn more. And Shell, I'll hand it back over to you to close us out tonight. Thank you. And thank you so much, Jennifer. You summed it up beautifully. And uh, thank you for you know, taking us through all of that. And uh, and thank you to the audience for coming on such a dreary day that we have in Scotland today. Wonderful. Well, a huge thank you to you, Chris, and to you, Jen, for a fascinating discussion. Uh, thank you to everyone for attending. We have another online event uh, next Wednesday, Success Factors at Work with another alumnus, Paul Sloan. So you can register for that via the website. And do keep an eye on the webpage and your emails for either more online events or fingers crossed, uh, we'll be back in person in college uh, in the autumn. So hopefully see you back in college then. And in the meantime, you can connect with other Trinity Hall members uh, via our online community, linkhall.org. But thank you for joining us this evening. And again, a huge thank you both to Chris and to Jennifer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. All right, okay. Bye.